Uh, I'd like to introduce Alex De Little to you today. Um, Alex is a sonic artist and researcher with bases in Leeds and London. His practice encompasses installation, composition, performance and workshops, and his practice is concerned with the interrogation of listening as a way to understand environment, self and social relations. Alex's work and collaborations have been featured at the Venice Biennale, the Tate Modern, Somerset House, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, the Health Museum in Houston, Den Fria Center for Contemporary Art. Was that a fair effort? Fair, fair thank you. Uh, in Copenhagen, uh, the National Science and Media Museum, the Contemporary Music Festival, Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival, and Hepworth in Wakefield. Um, he's recently completed a practice-based PhD um, at the University of Leeds and is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Leeds and Humanities Research Institute and is also a member of the Centre for Audiovisual Experimentation, a visiting lecturer at the University of Leeds and a visiting practitioner here at LCC. Let's make him very welcome. Thank you so much. Um, just want to start by saying I was very flattered to be asked to come and do this today. Um, I've been following the work of CRESAP for a number of years now and a lot of it's had a big impact on my own practice, so really great to be here. Um, I'm going to spend the next 90 minutes or so talking, hopefully not too densely, about the last four years of my practice, which I'm broadly calling spatial listening. But in a kind of um, Pauline Oliveros deep listening style, I'd quite like to just spend a couple of minutes um, doing some collective warm-ups to kind of bring us into our bodies and breath a bit before we, we sit for that long stretch of time. So if you want to jump to your feet. I mean, this is all, uh, the, the thing, uh, one thing to say is that this is all non-obligatory. So if anyone wants to say seated, feel most welcome to. Oh, it's really, this is really bright. Okay, so what I want to start doing is just by shaking our right hand. So you want to get your fingers nice and blurry can't see any of the specific digits. It's just a kind of blur of hand. And then what you want to do is take that up to the elbow. So you're going from the elbow. Let's get that bit. And then you guessed it. Next, we're going up to the shoulder. Let's get the whole thing going. Right? That's brilliant. And now um, your left hand, same thing. So get your left hand nice and blurry. No, keep your right hand going. Don't want to see you stopping. Don't want to see you stopping. And then up to the elbow. And up to the shoulder, both hands, keep them going, high energy, nice, very good. Now introduce the right foot. <laughs> and then up to the right knee. And then all the way up to the hip. Get that going nicely. Again, your toes are really blurry. Okay, now swap feet and your left foot. Your hands still going, high energy on the hands. Remember, you're going all the way up to the shoulder. Okay, and up to the knee, up to the left knee, and up to the left hip. Brilliant. High energy for five seconds, five, four, Three, two, one, okay, stop. Centered, nice and centered. Now this is something that um, in the deep listening tradition they call blopping. And what we wanna do is plant our feet roughly shoulder width apart. And we're just gonna bounce our bodies like this. And just gonna feel yourself engaging all of those vital organs. You're bringing blood to your core. Just keep the breath nice and even. Okay, that's brilliant. I'm just gonna blop for a few more seconds. Great, you look great. <laughs> okay, so now we'll just bring yourself to a kind of gentle stop, and we're gonna practice um, another alignment practice which is used in deep listening. So the knees are soft. You can shut the eyes if you like, and just bring your attention to the breath, okay? And what I want you to, to imagine doing now is each time you breathe in, you're breathing in from the floor, or beneath the floor, up to your heart and you're breathing out from your heart down into the floor. Okay, and with each breath, you're breathing in from further underground and breathing out further into the earth. Okay, so just practice that. And now we're going to extend the practice slightly. So we breathe in from floor to heart. From heart, we breathe out through the crown of the head into the sky above us. We breathe in from the sky above us to the heart and out into the ground. In from ground to heart, out from heart to sky. In from sky to heart, out from heart to earth.
that's fantastic stillness. So when you're ready, if you'd all just like to resume your seats in your own time. Just keep that stillness. I'm going to read you a passage to open the talk. You can have your eyes open or closed. You shout loudly and sharply into a large reverberant space. You are mindful of the sound you make and the energy and corresponding, corresponding muscular feedback that was required to create it. Trains of sound waves unfurl from you as if from a rocking boat on a calm lake, radiating in all directions before colliding with material surfaces. With each collision, these trains of sound waves reflect back into the space, filtered by its material properties. They intercept you at different times. Each perceptible interception testifies to a passage. Each passage expresses an element of the space in which you find yourself. These passages of sound continue onward. Perceptible reflections become reverberant haze. As the sound reverberates, the architecture energetically reinforces the frequencies that match its proportions, whilst attenuating those that do not. The timbre of your voice is thus subsumed by the space. This sound is your muscular energy translated into vibratory force. Over time, the air through which it propagates and the surfaces of the space gradually claim this energy and the sound decreases in intensity until it crosses the threshold of silence. Just as sound requires energy, listening requires energy. From the moment that you stop sounding, you follow your voice as it leaves your body, taking on an agency of its own and mixing with the architecture. The first reflections articulate the proportions of the space in relation to your position within it. As the timbre of your voice is subsumed by the space, you hear your surroundings as frequency. As the threshold of silence is crossed, you hear the space as temporality. By sounding, you act on the space and in return, it acts on you. As you stretch your ear towards these sonic essences, you create the architectural environment in your listening. But you also constitute your auditory self here, now, in this space. You exist alongside the sounds of your creating, in approach of the spatial environment, and in approach of your auditory self from moment to moment as the sound gradually dissipates. Through this act, you become mindful of a sonic way of being in space, a becoming present which is defined by a mixing with it rather than a separation from it. In your listening, you create an auditory time space that is restless and dynamic, rendered by your attention and awareness. Ocular conceptions of your surroundings as a stable material volume are replaced with intensities, envelopes and timbres, perpetually modulated by the contours of the built. So I'm going to talk about my practice, um, but before I do that, I want to introduce you to some of the sort of theoretical grounding. This is a quote by um, Claudia Martino, who's recently finished her PhD at the Sam Practice Research Department at Goldsmiths. Our senses and perceptions are shaped by an addiction to high-definition visual experiences through technological interfaces between our bodies and the environment. So as the perception of space is inhibited by the excess of visual stimuli, other senses remain dormant in the background of our daily experiences. Ubiquity, immediacy, and saturation make it difficult to between, perceive between noise and to be aware of the shifts taking place. With the loss of corporeal experiences and physical references, this mode of, I beg your pardon, perceiving space is affecting our understanding, consciousness, and actions in the everyday. So in what Marc Auger, um, a French author who wrote a book called Non-Places, describes as a late capitalist era of supermodernity, we have a prevalent rise in yeah, what he describes as non-places, uh, which lack hist history or relationality and strip individuals of their individuality. Um, 
we also have this prevalence, as Martino mentions, of, of these kind of technological um, interfaces, so phones, um, getting between us and the environments that we occupy. And this is a really good example of that. This is the, um, I don't know if any of you have seen these already, but these are mobile phone uh, pavements, um, specifically designed for people who are on their phones uh, to not have to look up from their phones uh, and perceive the environment around them, which is quite dystopian, I, I, I feel like. Um, we also have um, a kind of rising predominance, especially in cities like London, of, of noise cancelling technology, which acts to, again, get in the way of uh, ourselves and our environment by essentially blocking it out. And Sony uh, have run a few quite interesting adverts, one of which I want to play you. Okay, you get the picture. <laughs> uh, the one I wanted to show you um, that I referenced in my PhD was um, the guy puts the headphones on and is, is in like, like a London street and then gets transported to this rainforest. So there's this real idea of kind of um, this, this tagline here, this idea of escaping, escaping our kind of corporeal reality and the environment in which, I, in which we find ourselves. A lot of my practice um, is about kind of ways of re reconnecting with that, whether it's you know, pleasant or unpleasant. It's about kind of how we can listen into our architectural surroundings. Um, so, Johani Palasma, he's a Finnish uh, architecture critic, and um, he suggests that this kind of compromised sensory dis disposition that is kind of, well, arguably compromised sensory dis disposition that's kind of exhibited in these kinds of um, these kind of emergences of, of mobile phone lanes of, of, of not necessarily listening much to your environment. Um, he argues that this is a product of Western philosophical biases towards the eye and that it's led to a pathology of the architectural environment. So he says that I believe that many aspects of the pathology of everyday architecture can likewise be understood through an analysis of the epistemology of the senses and a critique of the ocular bias of our culture at large. The ocular refers to the eye, so the bias of the eye within our culture at large and of architecture in particular. The inhumanity of contemporary architecture and cities can be understood as the consequence of the negligence of the body and the senses and an imbalance in our sensory system. So Palasma is concerned with um, this notion that he, in his book, The Eyes of the Skin, he tracks back through the kind of the, the Western ep episteme, the structures of knowledge, and kind of um, draws out these conclusions that often the ways that we transfer knowledge or have transferred knowledge in Western culture is it, mostly through the eye. And I, I'm interested in linking his theory to this guy, Henri Lefebvre. Um, some of you may be familiar with this book, The Production of Space. Um, it's centered on the notion that social space is a social product. So the idea is that every society, secre society secretes a space that in turn defines and regulates that society. And I think that if we read what Palasma is saying through this uh, model that Lefebvre puts forward, um, this, this compromised or arguably compromised disposition feeds into the production of des desensitized spaces that in turn perpetuate and reinforce it. So what I'm interested in doing in my practice ex is exploring non-ocular sensory modalities, particularly listening, well, only listening, um, as a way to kind of subvert this, this, this compromised um, sensory disposition or this biased sensory disposition towards the eye. Um, a simplification of Lefebvre's theory is in this quote by Winston Churchill, this notion that we shape our buildings and afterwards our building, buildings shape us. So this like, notion of a cycle of production, you know, the manner in which we are, so potentially arguably ocularly biased, is, le is, is um, responsible for the spaces that we develop and those spaces in turn uh, develop us. So, to listen is to open up to the world in all of its vibratory complexity. 
sound provides an alternate potentiality for relating to the spatial environment. In this talk, I'm going to put forward a practice that creates situations in which subjects come to sonically know architectural space through sounding and listening. What I mean by architectural space in this context is not place, but what we might refer to as concrete space, so the physical, the physical material space in which we find ourselves. Um, the works that I'm going to talk about engage the acoustic phenomena of resonance, echo and reverberation as mediums that are sonically thought through in pursuit of understanding the spaces that contain them. It's important to note that the practice I'm going to talk about does not argue for the ear above the eye. Rather, I seek to pursue the ear but as take, taking the part out of the whole in order to see what uh, listening spatially can contri contribute to our, our sensory whole. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, I, I want to really focus on the practice, um, and I've never spoken for this long before. Um, I'm going to talk until uh, four o'clock. Um, I wanted to talk about a bit of theory first, a bit of a kind of paradigm for what I mean by listening and what I mean by listening spatially. Um, but I want to spend the best part of an hour talking about various projects. And within that, I'm going to play lots of uh, clips. I'm going to do a bit of a, a demo on this uh, synthesizer. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for some discussion. So um, what I think I might do first is show you a video of one of my workshops. And I'm going to get on to talking about the workshops last thing. But before we kind of go into the theory, I want to plant a, a notion of kind of the kind of situations that I that, that my practice unfolds in. So I'm just going to play this two minute example. Take a moment, take a moment just to listen to the sound in the space. Fill your breath again. So please. And when you're ready, you may begin. Oh. So that's an example of uh, one of my spatial listening workshops, which kind of extend from the practice of, of Pauline Olivares' deep listening. I'm going to talk about that last, but I wanted to see that now. And um, I might have to abridge some of this theory, but I did want to run through some of the ideas that I'm exploring here. This is a quote by um, this guy called Raviv Gankrov, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, he originally trained as an architect and then came on to sound uh, later in his career, and now much of what he does kind of interrogates uh, the spatial using the sonic. And he says, listening structures the audible world in a different way. Attention to hearing literally changes the experience of surroundings, possibly in a more potent manner than the equivalent tunings of vision. Because with vision, you always have the relatively static material reference to fall back upon. In sound, the space you experience is in flux. It is exactly what you make of it. It is a quintessential perceiver-centric space. In that sense, addressing the sonic aspect of architecture is not so much about adding sound into the built environment, it is really about rethinking listening. Now, my work um, is concerned with uh, rethinking listening as a way of knowing space. Picking up on Palasma's criti critique of the negligence of the body and the senses, um, it takes an approach that puts the individual at the center of the experience, experiential question, challenging them to create their own understandings through sonic engagement. So all of the works are about getting people to do listening or to do spatial listening. And the work, I, I might not dwell on this bit for too long, but is based, um, this, this idea of listening is based on uh, a deeper philosophical layer, um, which is grounded in phenomenology. 
And there's a scholar called Ma Ma Maurice Merleau Ponty who pub published quite a well known text called The Phenomenology of Perception. Um, and that provides the basis for con the consideration of listening. So, what he's interested in doing is um, placing in abeyance the assertions arising, arising out of the natural attitude, the better to understand them. This, this idea of the natural attitude uh, links in with um, the notion that we accept the world as it is or in the way that we are without necessarily questioning the, uh, questioning the way in which we are or act or perceive. So he's interesting, interested in um, this notion that the world is already there before reflection begins. And the, the efforts of phenomenology are concentrated upon reachieving a direct and primitive contact with the world and endowing that contact with a phil philosophical status. Um, yeah, the natural attitude is a state in which the essences of things are overlooked due to an unquestioned belief in the world or a bias towards accepted truths. Um, and he wants to establish this, this idea of establishing a dialogue with the pre-objective. So the idea that science for us is something that's subjective or, or knowledge is, a, is an ob objective truth. Um, Merleau-Ponty wants to return to the pure essence of sensing, of, of interacting with the world through touch, through sound, through sight. Um, and this is the man himself. So, there are a few important facets of this phenomenological framework for me, or, or in the ways that they prepare approaches to listening. The first is um, how we might define space within phenomenology. This notion, w Maurice Merleau-Ponty describes that space um, opens up from the perspective of the, the sensor, or the, he says the viewer. Um, the perspective from an individual at a given moment in time. He mentions that rather than a mind and a body, man is a mind with a body, a being who can only get to the truth of things because his body, as it were, is embedded in those things. So he talks about post-impressionist art and the work of Cezanne, the notion that there is no sort of one perspective, and that Cezanne's work, the reason that people, oh, this was written, sensitive uh, because it was written at the time, so in the late 1800s, people might have found this work lazy or kind of inaccurate. But in fact, Merleau-Ponty argues that it's rich. Its richness comes from the fact that it represents multiple possible perspectives. Um, he also talks about this notion of intersubjectivity. This is quite a weird photo, isn't it? Um, I wanted to, he talks about this notion of being honeyed, um, which I think is a really important way to understand the way in which knowledge emerges through phenomenological thought. Um, so he says that the world is produced in intersubjective dialogues between the body and objects. He conjures the image of honey running over the hand, describing its properties, its stickiness, viscosity, and color. He emphasizes that these qualities are not innate to the honey, but a project, product of its interaction with the subject. As he describes, the living exploring hand, which thought it could master this substance, instead discovers that it is embroiled in a sticky external object. What is here referred to as being honeyed describes an interaction between subject and object in which the two things constitute each other as such. For Merleau-Ponty, things can only be understood in the light of the dialogue between an embodied subject and the external object which bears a, qu a given quality. And by extension, the qualities which things possess determine the types of behaviors that they may provoke in us. So this notion that the honey isn't in and of itself, it comes into being through our interaction with it, this notion of intersubjectivity. And I'm interested in exploring that and listening. Um, one of the scholars, fantastic um, thinkers you have in this institution, Sal Salome Vogelin, um, uses Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception as a basis for the theorization of listening. And this is kind of the grounding or the cornerstone of, of how I might define listening in this project. This idea that the listening subject invents. He or she practices an innovative listening that produces the world for him or her in a phenomenological sensory motor action towards the herd. And his or her's auditory self is part of the herd in reciprocal intersubjectivity. So this idea of listening is a reaching towards something which kind of in turn gives back. Listening as a critical motility practices Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology as a process of doubt. The critical listener of um, himself is full of doubt about the herd and doubtful in his or her complicity he or she needs to hear and hear again to know his or herself in an intersubjective being in a sonic life world. So this notion of um, 
um, and subjectivity in regards to the visual is quite interesting because we're dealing with permanence. As, as, Rank, as Gancroft was saying, these, we have this static reference to fall back on. Whereas in sound, often what we're dealing with, unless it's kind of perfectly consistent, is temporal and ephemeral. So this notion of doubt is injected into this process of intersubjectivity. Not sounds, but phenomena. I'm interested in um, not dealing with um, sound as such in this listening, um, intersubject li intersubjective listening, but dealing with acoustic phenomena. Um, I'm, I'm interested to know your thoughts. Can anyone here, um, if I were to talk about, in terms, of, in terms of acoustics, talk about resonance? What, what, uh, could someone offer a definition of what resonance might be? I don't want to push anyone. Got any hands? Stick your hand up if you want to. <laughs> Are we familiar with these words? Resonance, reverberation, echo. Yeah. So these all describe these words all describe acoustic phenomena, which are to do with the physical behaviour of sound within concrete space. And I'm interested in harnessing these uh, phenomena, which are perceptually identifiable. We can tell, we can learn to identify them as ways of understanding uh, architectural environments. So I use these phenomena because they are in equal parts architectural and sonic. They are neither sonic nor spatial. They operate somewhere in between the two. They are ephemeral and structural. They offer an intelligible way in to the compl complex entanglement between sound and space. They describe to a listener their spatial surroundings as a function of location, and their location as a function of spatial surroundings. So for, if, for example, I shouted and there was a reflective surface 20 meters away from me, I would hear my voice return to me. My position in space is described through the phenomena of echo in relation to my position in space and the location of the architecture around me. Echo, therefore, offers a route in to understanding the environment in any situations in which it may be perceived. So the other reason for placing, placing an emphasis on phenomena rather than specific architectural spaces is, is that they are ubiquitous. Um, and my works create situations of listening in relation to phenomena and not specific sites, which positions them as methodologies of sounding and listening for unpacking all manner of spaces in which these phenomena manifest. So for example, resonance is a, a phenomena in which we, which, which we hear uh, in many or the majority of enclosed spaces, which we'll explore in this space in a moment's time. For example, when you're singing in the shower and some notes sound louder than others. Um, we can use that as a way into understanding those spaces. Uh, reverberation uh, is experienced in, you know, you will have experienced it in churches or large empty spaces, or long tunnels. Echoes are ex uh, experienced really readily in outdoor spaces where there are lots of reflective surfaces. So these are all ways that we can kind of enter into through listening uh, a sonic sense of, of, of our architectural environment. There's some more theory on sonic ways of knowing, um, which I don't want to sort of linger on too long. But this idea of, of phenomenology, phenomenological listening in, in Salome's work, um, in, in, in this practice I'm interested in understanding how, how the practice itself can um, present new ways of knowing, of understanding, and how we might talk about those or define those. Yeah, so we're not talking about epistemic text, textual knowledge anymore. We're not talking about writing. Uh, we're not talking about image, but we're talking about sound as a route to knowing things um, and listening as a way of getting there. And there are three kind of um, key theories that I, I base my research on. Um, and um, two, of, two, one of, two of the names are relatively familiar. One's very familiar. So we've got Annie Gore. Um, Julian Henriquez, who I believe was part of this series, I think last semester or last year. And in the middle, Stephen Feld, who's an ethnomusicologist. We've got three really important theories. And I think those of you who are from sonic arts practice or sound practice backgrounds, or even not, um, these, these three thinkers are really worth looking at, just from um, in a broad way of kind of conceptualizing how sound um, can possibly translate knowledge. And I kind of try and triangulate or try and wrap these three theories up. So thinking about this phenomenological 
um, approach to listening through acoustic phenomena, these ways of theorizing knowledge help me structure the works. So I think about how to structure the works in terms of how knowledge might be derived sonically. So the first one we have is um, Julian Henriquez's Sonic Logos, and it comes from a book which explores um, sound system culture. It's this his area of speciality, and through this study of sound system culture, he develops this notion of the Sonic Logos, and this notion of thinking through sound. So Henriquez uh, says that thinking through sound is distinguished from thinking about anything, and it's posed in opposition to and as a critique of established Western epistemologies. In thinking through sound, objects are replaced with processes. Coded representations are replaced with a medium. And thoughts are replaced with feelings, often independent of conscious reflection. Henriquez talks about this notion of um, thinking through sound or listening as a way of working through a medium so that we become part of it and it becomes part of us. So this notion of mixing or intersubjectivity and the idea of listening as a process. So rather than this sort of notion of discrete knowledge that we have, when we read a book, we kind of remember this information, the idea of sonically knowing as a, as a, as a process, yeah, rather, than a kind of, rather than a kind of arrival, I think is a really important distinction to make. Then we have Stephen Feld's acoustomology, which is another really interesting um, theoretical grounding. And this is a product of Stephen Feld's work with the Kaluli tribe um, in the Basavi rainforests of Papua New Guinea. He spent several years there as an ethnographer, studying the, the um, sort of sonic culture of these people who use sound to kind of communicate along distance through dense rainforests to kind of imagine their world. He comes up with this theory of acoustomology or acoustic understanding. So in acoustomology, knowledge isn't simply gained, but rather one knows through an ongoing, cumulative and interactive process of participation and reflection. And I think that's really important. In sound, we are, we are ingrained, we are entrenched in this process of participation. You can't but participate in sound. So this notion of putting out and receiving. And he places a particular emphasis on what is gained through the reflexive feedback of sounding and listening. And you, uh, as I'll sort of say a bit more about in a minute, that, that, that notion of, of sounding and listening is really important in this work. And Solik, Solik knowledges, he goes on to characterize them as experimental, contextual, fallible, so echoing uh, Salome's notion of doubt there, changeable, contingent, emergent, opportune, subjective, constructive, and selective. And then finally, we have Annie, um, who wrote this brilliant paper which explored this notion of uh, um, echo in archaeoacoustics. And as part of it, she kind of builds on the work of these two previous scholars, Feld and Henriquez. And I think the really important thing um, that, that Annie does is she engages the work of a theorist called Donna Haraway um, to talk about situatedness, the idea that these knowledges are not the same for everybody. They, are, they completely depend on who we are as subjective beings in, the, in, in our world. Um, you know, culture, age, our um, gender, ethnicity, um, the, the, our physical kind of uh, auditory apparatus. So she builds on Donna Haraway's concept of situated knowledges, um, arguing for a mode of embodied sonic thinking which emphasizes the partiality, anti-universalism, and political, ethical de demands of situatedness. That's a theory that is also worth uh, looking a little bit more into. So that before I move on to the practice, the last thing I want to say is that these sonic ways of knowing are fundamentally different to the ocular epistemologies which plasma uh, so vehemently criticizes. They emerge through the doubtful phenomenological act of listening, engaged either as a way of working through a medium, as in Henry Kayser's paradigm, or in reflexive combination with sounding, as in Feld's paradigm. Sonic knowledges are situated, taking into account a diversity of unique embodied subjectivities. They're formulated situationally and as a product of acoustic and social relations. What is known is transient, ephemeral, and emergent. Cool, so we're on about 10 past. So the practice in this project explores listening as a gateway to knowing and understanding the architectural environment through acoustic phenomena. And these knowledges and understandings open up uniquely for each subject through the intersub intersubjective dialogues in which the built is sonically constituted in parallel with the making present of a sense of auditory self.
The first selection of pieces I want to talk about are called ear pieces. They kind of playfully engage um, this, this text score by Oliveros um, called Ear Piece. Um, Pauline Oliveros, for those of you who don't know her work, was a, um, I think she died two or two and a half years ago, um, an American uh, composer and sound artist whose um, biggest body of practice was called deep listening. And rather than being concerned with the production of um, works, she was, con she was concerned with the uh, production of a practice of listening um, as a way to kind of gain a, uh, a, a different understanding of the world, which is why her work is kind of so integral to what I'm thinking about. So these are listening devices. And um, when I started out on this, on this sort of, um, I should say that, uh, if I haven't already, that this, this arc of work, it, it covers essentially the time I was studying for my PhD. And initially, what I was interested in doing was thinking about the way in which spaces are designed, maybe designing sonic spaces myself in order to kind of provoke certain auditory engagements from people. I quickly realized that as a PhD student, there was no way that I could access those kinds of budgets or, um, uh, or permissions. So I had to kind of scale it down. And um, I'm going to present listening devices, um, a few different examples of these. Um, and these works prepare the listening engagement with the other works in, in, that I'm going to tell, uh, talk about. So they, the idea of these is not that they kind of necessarily give us these sonic knowledges of space, but that they switch on our ability to listen. And the, and the listening devices do that by um, um, kind of getting rid of our normative way of listening. They, they change our ears or they replace the way that we, they, they alter the way that we hear in, in the, um, in the hope that when we remove them, we will return to our naked ear with a kind of renewed uh, sensibility, um, a, a renewed kind of knowledge of what it is to listen with our innate uh, hearing apparatus. So they're based on these. Um, put your hand up if you've seen these before. I imagine lots of you have. Yeah, a few of you have. OK. So these are um, acoustic defense structures, which um, still line the south and uh, east coast of the United Kingdom. They were used um, to, uh, through listening, to detect planes kind of up to 400 miles away. And the people who were trained to use them were trained to um, know not just where the plane, like how far away the plane was, but what type of plane it was and the, sp the speed that it was traveling at. So this is one instance. Again, this scholar Ravev Gankrov, he, he published a really interesting paper which talks about these as a singular instance of the development of architecture um, um, for listening. Yeah, architecture which is designed for sonic engagement. Um, and I was interested in that notion and in the notion of kind of resurrecting that sensibility through these built, wearable built devices in order to provoke listening. So putting something on or designing a structure which in itself would would instill listening. Um, these, this project started in 2015, and I worked with um, an architect called Lara Karadi, who I met uh, through a project called Musark, which is a choir based at the Sir John Cass um, Architecture School at London Met. And it started as a, as a way for architects to kind of um, think about sound through singing. So Lara and I sort of used um, like basic craft uh, materials to create these, uh, to create these, uh, and a few other sets using kind of funnels and noise detectors for a series of workshops. So we went to uh, the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford, um, the Industry Museum in Manchester, and the Tate Modern. This was at the Tate Modern. So this set reverse uh, your ears. They, I should say, there's a set of about ten or twelve different types of listening devices, and they all do different things. So these ones swap your left and right ears, so you hear your left stereo side and your right, and vice versa. So they're kind of basic and stupid and fun, but the idea is that they, they play to the ocular, they play to the eye in order to engage the auditory, to engage the auditory. So, you know, people think they look hilarious, let me put them on, and then suddenly they, they find themselves listening and engaging uh, with their... Uh, acoustic environment sonically, and I think that's that was the important part of this for me. That was the, sort of the essence of this project. Um, yeah. So, have I got anything more to say about those ones? Oh, yeah. I wanted to play you. So, I made a recording at the um, at the Tate Modern 
uh, workshop. Uh, and this is some, some audio of, of kind of people experiencing the listening devices. How are you guys finding it? I love it. Cool. I love that entire experience. <laughs> what, what did you love about it? Just, a, like, just being able to just hear the ambient noise of like the people around you and having to like focus the intention of your sense of sound when you actually want to listen to something. I don't know, it's just different. So it's, uh, it's focusing my hearing in a specific direction or like kind of to the sides rather than I guess in front of me, which it would be normally. Yeah. So I can hear you better so you if I'm... <laughs> and if you turn around, so it makes you want to sort of turn your head like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's really cool. Because you normally hear what's in front of you, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to I wanna hear the reverse thing. Oh, where did it go to? Uh, there's a reverse here. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to try it? I hear much better. You do? But yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's... Um, what does it feel like? Clearer? Yeah. It does, I mean, yeah. I mean, it does also limit your vision. Yeah. So you well, you hear better, but you see less. Yeah, yeah. So in a sense, you need to be a bit more aware of your... Um, Hearing. Um, it feels like I'm inside like a wind tunnel yeah. or I'm in some sort of uh, yeah, hurricane or something. Thanks very much. It's really strange. Yeah. What do you think is happening? Uh, what do you think, what do I think is well, physically happening to my ear? How does it work? I don't know. What context, oh, what, I don't know. What, what context do it's, I think it sounds a lot like uh, when you put a seashell to your ears, yeah. except that it's a bit more windy than sea. Than the, the sea. It sounds like a drain in one of my ears. It's really weird. A drain. Ooh. <laughs> oh! So my God, I didn't know you, you get the idea. It's uh, what I found so interesting, uh, or what began to emerge through this this kind of uh, this project was how much we lack a vocabulary for describing sonic experiences. Every time I asked someone what they were experiencing in relation to a different set of listening devices, so you'd have ones that collect sound, ones where you can only hear what's going on below you, behind you, above you, listening devices that resonate at different pitches, and so on. So they sort of iteratively explore all of these different ways of, uh, of processing sound physically. Uh, but, but people would, as would respond kind of emotionally, some would respond physically, so the language was so different depending on who you spoke to. Some people felt threatened, some people loved it, some people felt more at one with their environment, some people felt more separated from their environment. So they, already, there's this kind of, this notion of the physical shape in microcosm, so they're not, you know, architectural spaces that contain us, but they're miniature architectural spaces. This project sort of, to me, demonstrated the power of, of the spatial to uh, define our sonic experience. Um, then the next iteration of the listening devices project was looked like this. Um, and these were 3D printed uh, listening devices, which were based on uh, a, a, a real scan of a bat's ear. Um, I was asked to m make a piece for an exhibition up at the National Science and Media Museum, and it was called Super Sensors. So it was this notion of, again, it was exploring sort of non-ocular sensors, uh, and they were interested in the listening devices, but, but sort of as related to an animal. And in my research, I, I looked into kind of, um, I think obviously the, the animal that springs to mind is the bat because it explores the, you know, it knows the world sonically. They have eyes and they can see, but echolocation is their primary uh, mode of, of, of navigation. And there's an e essay by a guy called Thomas Nagel, um, which is titled, What is it like to be a bat? And I think I wanted to sort of investigate this notion of recreating the listening experience of a bat. Um, not, not obviously kind of in any sort of realistic way, but again, using this, this ocular to play to the oral, you know. Um, so we um, say that, that, yeah, that's the title of the essay. And so I found a guy over at Virginia Tech in, uh, in Virginia in North America um, who had actually gone to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington and scanned the ears of all of the dead bats there. And he had a, a cache of, of um, 3D scans of all these bats' ears. And I basically said, is there any way I can have one of these? Uh, and he said, okay. Uh, so he sent me that. 
Um, and then I worked with a guy at the Department of Engineering at U Leeds University to sort of turn it into that. And so what we did is we cut out the, we sort of cut across here, and then we cut in an aperture and um, mounted it flat on the ear so that it would kind of sit like that. So essentially the, the pinner of the bat replaces the human pinner. Uh, and then these were accessible in the gallery for, for people to engage with uh, at will. And again, of course, you know, we, we can't possibly recreate the subjective experience of a bat, but this, this kind of, for me, it tries to uh, engage a manner of thinking towards the world uh, in the manner of a creature for whom the world is sound. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a more of a um, metaphorical uh, thing than a literal thing, but they do really um, make sound seem very directional. So if you put them on and shut your eyes and turn around, it's really, it's kind of, it sounds a, like more high definition, uh, the sound is amplified and it's also incredibly directional. You have a much, um, the bigger surface area kind of gives you much more of a precise di direct uh, sense of where sounds are coming from. So in sum then, listening devices are wearable oral architectures that bring sound to the experiential four. The acoustic properties of each pair create for the wearer an altered sonic reality that engages them in listening. As architectures, listening devices allow people to listen through physical space and demonstrate in microcosm the potential for the built to interact with sonic, the sonic conscious, calling implicitly for a more creative oral approach to spatial production. In creating situations of listening in which people listen through an altered sonic reality, listen, listening devices require subjects to listen back towards their naked ear, affording a renewed sense of the innate auditory modality. So two things. They, they demonstrate that the physical shapes the oral. They also refresh our sense of, of, uh, of hearing. And they do so in order to uh, then prepare the subject for interaction with other that some of the other works, which in themselves are designed to create um, sonic knowledges of, of uh, architectural space. So I'm actually going to skip that project, and I'm going to go straight to this project, which is called Reflection Position. And so the way th that this kind of portfolio of works operates is that it takes discrete acoustic phenomena and explores those through different types of listening in order to arrive at sort of knowing or understanding the spaces in which the pieces exist. So this piece, um, is essentially this kind of strange looking gizmo. Um, and it's a loud hailer array. And what it does is it creates the possibility for a multitude of arch architectural spaces to be known in listening through echo or reverberation. Um, from a bank of samples, drawing from a bank of samples, it constantly emits rhythmic and repetitive impulses or impulse loops through the four loudspeakers, so that you can see three, but there's one on the back as well, um, which together afford a 360 degree emission pattern in which each speaker covers a roughly a 90 degree radius. Sound signals physically interact with the acoustics of the chosen space, producing reflection patterns that form an environment of sounds, what I'm referring to here as an impulse topography waiting to be heard. In any given location, the pattern of direct and reflected sound, the impulse signature, so the impulse topography describes the, the, the field of echoes created in the whole space. The impulse signature describes what I'm hearing, where I am standing. Um, the impulse signature um, describes to a listener from their position and orientation in space, its size, shape, quality, and quality relative to their position. So this intervention renders the architectural space in which it is located as acoustic perceptual fields potentialities for sonic exploration and sonic knowing. So when I, was when I was kind of devising this piece, as you can see there, I blindfolded the people. So that kind of, that, that getting rid of the eye there uh, kind of increases this opening of the ears. And we did a lots of, we did lots of um, activations and warm ups like the, ones, some of like, like the ones that we tried at the beginning of this talk. Here are some of the studies for the, um, the piece when I was initially thinking about the idea. So what we have here is this kind of simulated square space. Of course, this is all in the 2D plane. This is what we call in acoustics a wavefront diagram. And what I wanted to show is just this, this notion again of like a repeated impulse, like this same kind of thing that the loudspeakers emit. Um, and imagine that this is say like a, public, like a public square or something with reflective walls. So the sound is gonna bounce off the walls. 
what an impulse topography might look like. Yeah, so this would be from one loudspeaker at the edge of the space, and you can see it's emitting these impulses. And the impulses are spreading out here, reflecting off these walls, beginning to reflect off this back wall. And you can see uh, these patterns develop and develop until we have this kind of fully fledged or m more or less static impulse topography. Yeah. So, of course, sound is transient and ephemeral, but by repeating the same thing again and again and again and again, we can create a situation that simulates an almost stable environment through which someone can move. And as they move, this impulse signature is constantly changing. So I'm hearing what I'm hearing this, uh, is constantly phasing. Yeah. If I'm here, these waveforms are going to reach me at different times to if I'm standing here, or if I'm standing here, or if I'm standing here. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, and then here's another. This is called a ray tracing diagram. So rather than fo following the wave front, I'm following the um, pattern of refraction. I'm no, I'm sort of no, no acoustician really, but this is just to demonstrate the kinds of patterns that might arrive. So, so each uh, color refers to a particular speaker. Um, and you can see that we have these kind of crossings happening. So in any given space, you will, you will hear the sound from all, spe all four speakers at different times. You might hear the same speaker sound refracted multiply. Um, these are like very simple studies which show the concept, but in reality, of course, we don't operate in perfectly square, perfectly reflective spaces. So the, rea the real oral experience is much, much, much more complex. Um, and what I want to do really is, I suppose, just play you a bit of, of the thing in action so you can kind of understand um, how it comes across. So this is a video of me uh, on the roof of a deserted car park in Leeds, um, sort of moving around and recording. And, and uh, you should know that um, the, the video and the audio aren't synced, so, but, it, but the audio is recorded at the same time as the, this video. Yeah, there's a range of different loops that I was using. going to skip on a bit to the final sample I use, which is much faster. subtle phasings. And the pictures that kind of pronounce themselves.
people. So I should say there that each speaker, whilst they're playing exactly the same rhythmic pattern in unison, each speaker has a different pitch. So as you kind of move around, the different pitches pronounce themselves in relation to each other, and you kind of get this morphing haze of sound where different elements of it present each other in different ways in relation to each other. Um, so reflection position is an experimental tool for knowing spaces through impulses, the creation of impulses and resulting echoes or reverberations that, 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 that come through the interaction between the sound and the architecture. Of course, if it's inside, then we're talking much more in terms of re reverberation uh, of, of, of sound lingering in space, whereas this recording deals with echo, these very dry, perceptible individual sounds. Um, and they convey the acoustic properties of a space uh, from a listener's point of view in relation to the, the position of the loudspeaker array and the sounds used. Movement provides a gateway to listening and space is understood as a series of positionalities and perspectives perceived through, the ch through changing impulse signatures. So I'm interested in this notion that you, know, you move in the space and you're hearing something that's developing. And in hearing that, that, that changing signal then uh, creates a further Im impulse or desire to move and explore further. What's, what's it going to sound like in that corner? What's it going to sound like over here? So we also developed a series of text scores which kind of play with the interaction of multiple people. The idea of, you know, marking positions in the space that might seem particularly acoustically interesting and so on. Um, and so the resultant spatiosonic knowledges here are ephemeral, of course, they're part of this process of movement. And a result of autonomous engagement, only you, uh, in any case, can, can experience these. Um, they're situational and they're contingent. So again, echoing this, this, um, this discourse of Feld, these kinds of sonic uh, proposals of characterizations of sonic knowledge are kind of borne out here in this work. Um, Okay, the next piece I want to show you is, is, is called Spatial Drone, and it's a series of pieces. And here we explore the, the acoustic phenomenon of resonance. Um, just, I think probably the most easy and effective way of, of describing resonance is, is that, uh, yeah, when you're singing in the shower and some notes sound louder than others, who hasn't experienced that? That's amazing. That's really satisfying. So all of you have experienced that. Okay, the reason, so what's happening there as you're singing in the shower is that um, when you reach a certain pitch, the wavelength of that sound is matching the dimensions of your shower cubicle. And the waveform itself reaches the wall. And because it matches the size of the room, it comes back over itself like this and creates what we call a standing wave. And that standing wave um, consists of areas of low and high sound pressure. So you have your, what we call nodes, the top of the waveform, and antinodes, the bottom of the waveform. And that wave, that sound wave, represents the dimensions of that space. So I'm positioning it in this research as a way into understanding that space. How can we hear the space? How can we hear the dimensions of the space through pitch, through resonance? How can we feel it in our bodies? And spatial drone is a series of drone works which kind of explore putting sound in um, into rooms and um, having listeners situated in the space, often lying down on, on kind of yoga mats in the dark and experiencing how these sounds play on their bodies. Um, so I'll just read a little overview. Um, they were developed at, during a, a residency in Manchester. They position the player, in this case, um, in the case of the Spatial Drone 1, it's a, it's a piece of a synthesizer at the center of a process of articulating resonance as a way to know space sonically and somatically. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and they experience, they explore resonance through um, situated listening, which is to say listening from fi fixed positions in spaces, um, which places an emphasis on the innate oral and somatic sensations as to do with body sensation of the frequencies themselves. Uh, rather than the interference patterns that they cause. So another series of work, it, it works that I did explore those. Um, so the processes of sounding in these uh, pieces, um, they cause our bodies, because we're dealing with resonances of acoustic space, of, of architectural spaces, you know, the shower cubicle is quite small, so the, the sounds within our human voice can, can excite the shower cubicle. Say, uh, so imagine this room, in a minute I'm going to use the synthesizer to make this room resonate. 
is much bigger. So our voices can't, don't have the sound power or, or frequency re response to it, what we say excite or to provoke these rooms to resonate according to their, their because, the, because the space is big, the wavelength required to, um, to resonate it is very long is, uh, and therefore very low in pitch. Sometimes even below the human threshold of hearing, which, is, which, which kind of ends around 20 hertz. This is a great diagram which, which is attributed to NASA and it describes the resonant frequencies of different areas of the human body. So I'm interested also with these pieces of, in exploring how the resonance of architectural spaces can overlap with the resonances of our very bodies. And in, in that um, kind of material um, networking, how knowledges can be produced, you know, how can you feel, can you feel an architectural space through vibration? What does that mean? So this piece, Spatial Drone 1, um, is a piece of a human, human and subtractive synthesizer. It's an improvisation. And it starts by, um, it, it's, it's a text score like this. And it starts by asking someone to tune the synthesizer um, to the fundamental frequency of a space. So to find a resonant frequency, and it describes how to do that. So. If, if it's too intense for anyone, just put your hand up and I'll make sure I bring it back down again. So I've, I've tuned this synthesizer to the space. And what that does, I'm going to go, I'm going to explore that a little bit more in a second. Um, the, the piece is based on the principle that the parameters used in subject, subtractive synthesis have the potential to directly control the manifestation of resonant phenomena. So I've got my standing wave. And then in, in synthesis, um, I probably won't go too much into the technical details of synthesis because it's you know, I don't know if it's worth it really, but um, we, we control sound according to its acoustic properties. We, we, we deal in partials, we deal in the harmonic series, we deal in overtones, we deal in complex waveforms. Imagine our standing wave is manifest in the space. The, the parameters that we use on the subtra subtractive synthesis, synthesizer, sorry, I'm gobbling my words a bit here, um, can control the physical behavior of that waveform in a way which will affect people's understanding of both the space um, and, and, and sort of themselves, I guess. And I, what I want to do actually, rather than talk about it too much, is um, kind of go through a bit of it. So I've got the synthesizer tuned to a resonant frequency within the space. I think that's probably the lower one. So you can all hear that, right? This, this, this waveform matches the space. And one of the key um, parameters that we have in synthesis is something called a, fi a filter, a cutoff filter. Put your hand up if you've heard of a cutoff filter. OK, oh yeah, it's brilliant. OK, that's what I like to see. Um, so when we sweep the cutoff filter open, yeah, we get the complex waveform. So the cutoff point is, is how many partials you're introducing. So if the fundamental frequency matches the space, because a set of two walls also deal with the harmonic series in the same way that a trumpet does or a clarinet does, this partial sweep can articulate different resonances as we go through. Because they will also, because they relate to the harmonic series, they also match the, uh, the, the acoustic properties of the walls, just in t just, but rather in terms of ratios. So I'm just going to sc scroll through a few here. So you can hear that's, I think, upper fifth. There's another one. So these are all resonant frequencies, and they all relate to the fundamental that the synthesizer's tuned to. So the synthesizer acts in itself as a way to control the manifestation of um, 
standing waves within a space. You can articulate different standing waves. You can talk about the relationship between the waves. You can uh, phase shift them. So I can, this is tuned to a um, square wave at the moment. And I can change the bandwidth of the wave. And what that does is that changes the phase and therefore where the wave is moving in the space. I can introduce two oscillators or two filters in multiple frequencies at once. All of this in the piece, I should say, happens incredibly slowly, but imperceptibly slowly, so as that the listener doesn't ex experience music in inverted commas, but rather a flow of changing sensations, all of which represent the architecture. So that's a really brief intro. I don't want to go on for too long, because I'm aware that I've only got a quarter of an hour left. Um, so this piece uses, as you can imagine, quite a lot of sound power. Um, this was in a residency in Manchester, which was in, in, in an abandoned shop. And we had the audience like lying down all around the space, and we switched all the lights off. Um, and the piece lasted for an hour. And what the player does, so the idea that there is there are two processes of knowledge, knowledge creation going here, on here. The piece is an improvisation. So the player has to use these parameters, some of the ones that I just described, and a, and a, and a load of other ones as well, um, to explore the space. So the idea is this, remember Feld, this reflexive process of sounding and listening. You make a gesture by changing a parameter on the synthesizer. You experience in your body or your ear how that manifests, how it plays on your body. And then you, you make the next gesture according to what you experience. So this notion of constantly feeding back to yourself, constantly listening and feeding back. So there's this kind of active process of listening and sounding on the part of the performer. The notion is that anyone can use this score to perform the piece. Um, and then the audience is receiving you know, the, the player's subjective experience of the resonance in the space. Does that make sense? A few nods, yeah. So that's the idea. And then that was the kind of beginning of this piece. And of course, you know, as I said, engaging these acoustic phenomena that you can do the piece anywhere. So I bought the synthesizer and just set it up before the talk and just playing around, you can tune into an acoustic, um, a resonant frequency and begin to play with it. So the idea is that this work can manifest in any uh, contained environment. Was that a question? Or no, no, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and so um, it, it's been done in different uh, rooms. The, the bigger the room, the lower the fundamental frequency of the space, um, the, you know, and this is where the knowledge process of knowledge creation begins to take place. The, it plays on your body in different ways. You have a different corporeal experience. The subjectivity of the player affects what you experience. So um, it's important to say in, in these, these works, they don't uncover the space. Yeah, they, unco they use sound to uncover different strata or, s or stratums of the space through the perspective of a given subjectivity. So everything is situated. Everything is transient. Everything is ephemeral. Everything is a process. So that's, um, sp that's Spatial Drone 1, and then there were further versions of it. So I worked with this guy, James Seabrook, who's this amazing tuba player from the Royal Northern College of Music, and we tuned his instrument to uh, the space. And uh, he worked a lot with overtones um, and detuning um, um, to kind of tune his tuba into the space. And then there have been various other iterations, so we did it. Uh, in Leeds in July with kind of 12 loudspeakers through the ground floor of a building and found the, the fundamental frequency of the entire ground floor and then sort of passed the, the sound through different rooms using a network of loudspeakers. So this is a kind of, I think of these works because they set up ways of engaging with spaces and there are many spaces. I think of them as sort of iterative projects rather than discrete works, if you like. This is, the, the, the sonic knowing is a process and uh, therefore the process of of, of, of the work. Uh, the work is not ever arrived at. This is always in process. It's only as good as its, 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 its performance in the here and now. So that's a, that's a shot of, of how I like the audience to be in these performances. So we do a lot of body work and we do a lot of kind of a a activations and get very settled and then um, it's quite a sort of immersive experience. So 10 minutes left. 
I don't want to, I'm probably going to skip through these projects, which is um, because I don't think I've got a lot of time and I want to get onto this spatial listening practice that I showed you a video of at the beginning. But this is the second thing to, to say, which is that um, when a resonance manifests in a space, we talked about this notion of nodes and anti-nodes, right? This is a, a topographical map of what it, a, a particular manifestation of a resonance looks like in a particular space. And it's by a guy called uh, Wallace Sabine, whose name is worth writing down. He was sort of the godfather of acoustics. Um, and he, this was one of his kind of most famous experiments. But basically, he played a, I think it was a C. Uh, and this was in, the, this was in a, a space in Harvard. Um, and he walked around the room, and he found that by listening, he could, he could deduce the pattern or the distribution of sound in the space, yeah? So, um, if I, I just want to try this really quickly before I explain the last thing, before I cut touch on the last piece of work and get you to explore, to, to experience this. Okay, so, for anyone who wants to, if you just walk up and down this middle aisle, you can hear, you can just get up out of your seats if you want to. You can hear how the sound in the room changes amplitude depending on where you stand. Oh, one sec, sorry. fade that out so you're getting that do, do you sense that there are some parts because this space isn't perfectly resonant because it's got so much acoustic treatment the um, the more the more reflective the space the higher the contrast between the nodes and the antinodes so if I did this in a really reflective room some of the antinodes you almost hear nothing you almost hear nothing and when you stand in a node it's overwhelmingly loud overwhelmingly loud. And if you play different um, resonant frequencies on top of each other, you have all this, this incredibly complex pattern of, of nodes and anti-nodes. Some of them you move your head and you hear something, some of them you have to move you know, a foot or a meter and you hear something, but all of them reflect the building. And there was a group of pieces that I did which were called resonant topography. So I talked about an echo or, resonant or reverberation topography earlier. These pieces were involved with the creation of resonant topography. So creating these geologies or geographies of sound in spaces and having humans experiencing them in various ways. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about these right now, but uh, the first one was um, an installation which used an iPhone app, uh, which is no longer on the, on the, IG, on the app store, but uh, that would convert color into brightness, uh, color into, fr into um, pitch into color and loudness into brightness. And there was a camera in the top of the space. And people would move around, and their phones would pick up the waveform where they were and, and make these trails. And then they would be projected onto the wall of the, of the, of the black box theater space. And over time, the resonant topography of the space would emerge through people's listening engagement with it. So you would see, you would, there'd be this process of kind of listening and exploring and visualizing, and visualizing the, the positions of the bodies of others. So this was kind of a real communicative piece, um, a kind of societal listening experience, if you like. And then the second one worked with um, these dancers, Hannah Buckley and Tora Head from the Northern School of Contemporary Dance. This was at the Hep Hepworth in Wakefield. And we filled this mill building with these huge uh, waves, and th these dancers developed choreographies in relation to the distribution of of sound waves in the space. 
So this piece asks the question, how do these topographies make us want to move? How do, they, how do our bodies express their distribution of sound? And gradually the audience was introduced. So the idea is that the there's a kind of pedagogy of movement and listening here. The, uh, the dance has introduced to the audience the, the, the distribution of sound. And there was an audience score, so people kind of went through this. So the last thing I want to talk about is, um, is, is, a, is, is the notion that whilst it's great to have these works, these works all help us listen into space, they help us work through these mediums, the, work, the problem with the works is they're always situated in performance environments or gallery environments with artistic demographics or specific types of demographics. And if we're talking, go back to the kind of um, rhetoric at the beginning of Palasma's um, criticism of the senses and these broader problems with architecture, I kind of arrived at this point where it didn't feel like enough just to make works and it felt like that wouldn't kind of have enough of an impact on, on, the, on the way that we listen or it wouldn't truly address uh, the subject, it was still, there was still this emphasis on the work, yeah, rather than the process. I think this notion of process is really important. Um, so, I am I'm ever inspired by the work of, of Pauline Oliveros, as I've mentioned. Who has heard of Pauline Oliveros? Okay, quite a few of you, that's good. So again, those of you who haven't, um, if you're interested in sound and listening, she's a really important figure, and I recommend that you, you check out her work. Um, so the, the final thing was to kind of engage these notions of echo, of res reverberation and resonance uh, um, in the form of a practice, something that we can do in any space with an assembling of, of bodies um, by developing a kind of series of text scores that constitute a practice of spatial listening. So how can we as people with very minimal resources uh, engage with spaces sonically? That's what the practice is asking. And how can we... Um, through doing this, develop ways of listening into and understanding our architectural environment. Um, so these scores, in the scores, participants excite spaces either with the voice, like when you sing in the shower, or using handheld percussion instruments, most often wood blocks, to create impulses, which will um, create, in turn, echoes or reverberations. This dynamic and embodied sounding and uh, embodied dynamic of sounding and listening uh, developed in the spatial drone pieces. This notion of feed it, feeding back, constantly feeding back, was what I used as the basis for this practice. So, you do something, you feel something; you do something else, you feel something else; you do something. And in that process of putting out and receiving, you're tuning further and further into the sensibility of the room in which you find yourself. Does that make sense? This kind of process of probing and feeding back, probing and feeding back. So whether you're doing it through the medium of echo, whether you're doing it through the medium of reverberation, or whether you're doing it through the medium of resonance. Um, so in every score, pretty much, participants are asked to listen closely for a particular acoustic event or qualities, such as a returning echo, the end of a reverberation tail, or the modal resonance of a room. The nature of what is perceived orally in a given situation informs the further process of sound creation. Um, and I think I really wanted to just show you, so I brought this, this is a publication um, that I made for a show at the, at the Royal Academy earlier this year. Again, it was part of a um, day of stuff about um, non-ocular senses, and it's a book that contains the, the spatial listening text scores. And they're categorized in um, relation to um, the different acoustic phenomena. So the first one is voice and modal resonance. So um, you have the, essentially the, the practice of the spatial drone pieces, but um, engaged using the voice. So I'm interested in how people can use their voices to uncover particular spaces. So this score is basically, and each of the um, sections will have a solo format. And then there's one for a group as well. So th they kind of in include different um, assemblages of people, but the idea is that they can, um, to unfold in any space. So the, the opening suggestion is find a resonant enclosed space with bare stone, concrete, brick, or similar surfaces. Staircases, bathrooms, corridors, caves, car parks, underpasses, cubicles, galleries, abandoned buildings, basements, garages, chapels, churches, and the list goes on. Um, and it sort of says stick your head in the corner of the space and then begin to use your voice to 
conduct these slow glissandi up and down until you find, until you hear a difference, until you hear the room speak. And then at each point that you hear that, you begin to slowly tune in. And then you begin to, and there are various techniques, but the vocal techniques are kind of similar to the way I was using the synthesizer. Anything that, that provokes the architecture. So you can see that they're all kind of methodologies. The um, reverberation pieces are all about creating sounds and then listening for the end of the reverberation, making a sound as that reverberation ends. You might have multiple people or one person. And the echo pieces are about playing in time with echoes and maybe moving around in different ways. So changing your proximity to a surface and seeing how the temporality of the echo might change. So there are probably about 20 different scores in here, but together they kind of create this um, fledgling practice. The idea is to create different iterations of this book um, as the practice develops. And the thing that's key about this for me is that instead of a work where you have the work and people experience it and it finishes, what I want to do in each of these spatial listening workshops is like harness the subjectivity, the feedback of the people that have, have done the practice with me and then feed it back into the practice. So to keep developing it according to people's experience of it. And that kind of prov provides this vessel for working through and in spaces and sound according to subjective experience. The practice is a vessel for collecting people's responses, subjective engagements. So it's nearly four. What I want to do, um, so yeah, so this is um, it, the, the Den Free in Copenhagen. This was um, exploring um, uh, echo location in uh, in the in the British Pavilion at the at the Venice Biennale. Um, this is a, one of the reverberation pieces taking place in uh, an art space in in Leeds. This is so. The other thing is though, uh, each spatial listening session is based on a sequence of activations and warm ups. Um, so we bring people into the bodies, into the breath. The idea that if we're going to enter into listening, we have to do so through our bodies, through kind of bringing ourselves into into an energy and, and an awareness. Um, what I want to do just before I finish is um, play you a video of of my kind of I guess singing in the shower esque people esque piece. This is um, a piece I was just talking about, um, about tuning the space into the resonant properties of a, of a given architectural space. Um, and it's the collective version. So it's, it takes place in a big stairwell and people are conducting this process of tuning their voices into the architecture. Yeah, so just to close, the, I'll, I'll play you a bit of this and then I'll um, give you a few reflections and then we'll, we'll do sort of 50, uh, half an hour, 20 minutes of questions. Cool.
Yeah, so you can really hear some of those, even though we're not physically in that space, you can really hear some of those those frequencies pronouncing themselves. And the idea is in the group version of the pieces, the kind of behavioral patterns of, of other people inform your own practice. So you could hear someone hitting a particular resonant frequency that then folds into what you're doing. So the idea is the group kind of teaches itself almost like it's some kind of hive mind um, about the acoustic properties of the space. So I just want to close by saying um, a slightly reflective passage um, about what I've, what I've said today. The practice um, that I've presented um, doesn't seek to levitate the ear above all of the other senses as any kind of solution. What it rather attempts to do is bring the oral to the forefront to examine what spatial listening or listening spatially might contribute to the sensory whole. Broadly speaking, the experiences of space afforded by the practice are non-totalizing, immediate, unquestionably attached to the present moment, and located in this space, here, now. They are inherently subject-laden, experienced as a here, now, rather than the detached there of the visual. The knowledges that these works formulate are contingent, relational, transient, ephemeral, and explicitly connected to the body with regards to both the perception and the emission of sounds. And there are three things that I'm working with at the moment. One is kind of um, extending this work to architectural or spatial, pra the, the, pra the community of architectural and spatial practitioners. The second is trying to sort of further theorize a language of acoustic knowing. Uh, and the final one is um, extending the work more into the public realm and outside of the kind of art institution or performance space. So those are kind of my on ongoing goals. Um, as it's five minutes past four, I think it's time to wrap up. So thank you all so much. I know that was a really long time to sit through. I hope um, it made some sense. Thanks. Alex, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. Questions? Oh, thank you. Um, we have to talk about the synthesizer piece. Um, hopefully you will allow me to have some doubts about how you present it or to question it. Because, I mean, I really enjoy all the parts of it and it resonates, like, it speaks a lot to me. But I disagree with how you talk about it. So let's see what you think about that. Um, to me, what we experienced or what I experienced, what actually that you threw the frequency that could be the most out of tune with the room. That's what I think. And that's what I felt. Like, I don't know if I can go through examples that maybe you know, so stop me whenever I'm saying things that you know. But like, when they build bridges, they need to make sure that the bridges are in tune with the wind, for instance, so that the bridges won't shake, because if they shake, they will break. So if they're in tune, and if they properly like resonate with the environment, they won't vibrate. Same things with buildings, for instance. Like buildings in Mexico City where there are a lot of earthquakes. They need to make sure that the buildings can be in tune with the earthquakes, with the vibrations, right? They need to be out of tune with the environment. Out? Yes. Because if a bridge is in tune, uh, I if it oscillates with a particular weather um, form or with, with movement of cars, for example, then it will be prone. In fact, there's a famous example of this taking place. Uh, a bridge is pinned between two or more nodes. And if it is in tune, it will begin to resonate. But really, and like, OK, so maybe it's just the slight idle tune. Because if I sing with someone and I'm really in tune with that person, it won't vibrate. But the second the person's a little, or I'm a little out of tune with that person, it will create oscillation that I will feel. And this is an example for me of being out of tune. You know what I mean? If we sing notes that are the exact same length, there won't be any big vibration. But the minute we're out of tune, I feel them. 
I think what you're talking about is beating patterns. Yes. So you're talking about two pitches being slightly out of tune wi with each other, which cause them to um, oscillate slightly different speeds and then create these variations in amplitude, which uh -huh. are called beating patterns. Yeah. How does that um, relate to synthesizer piece? Well, for me, it's the same thing. It's just that you used very low frequencies. So like the wavelengths are huge, but it since I don't know, it's just like, okay. But the for me, the, the, the idea that the room just started to vibrate so much, I don't know how, I don't know how it can mean that it's in tune with it, if the vibration is so intense. You know what I mean? Are you asking how to check whether a, a, a particular waveform is a resonant frequency or not? But like, because am I wrong, or you said that you were tuning in with the room Yes. This is where I you lose me somehow. Okay, so there are two ways of doing this. I kind of ended up doing it perceptually because I taught myself during the course of the project how to tell if if there a, a frequency is resonant or not. The but way that I stu I started doing it was by conducting acoustic analysis of a space. Uh -huh. So I'd use a loudspeaker and a microphone and take what's called an impulse response, uh -huh. which um, it measures the the response of the room over different frequencies and then um, a max MSP patch will, t will give me a list of the frequencies that uh -huh. resonate within the room. And initially I began by just tuning my sensors to those frequencies. Yeah. But you see, this is exactly the point of like r resonating with the room, as you said, clearly oh. it works. Yeah. But where I disagree is that saying that this, that creating this kind of resonances means tuning in. Ah. To me, it's more like tuning out so it resonates. So it's a it's a kind of philosophical question, but it's also acoustical, as I said, because of when there's such big vibrations or beatings. Because mm -hmm. I think it's the same, to be honest. Like I might be wrong, but I think it's the same physical I, I principle. Yeah. Then it means you're tuned out. But maybe it's philosophical. Maybe it's acoustical. But it's what? Oh, no, 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 no. no, you. Yeah, you can think. With I was thinking that that's the effect of a standing wave, which is in tune with the room, but is often an unpleasant se sensation. That's what I'm getting from yeah. this, the notion of it being, and, and that's definitely a key part of this, right? This notion of situatedness. For some people, it's a really unpleasant experience. For others, it's an immersive and kind of whole experience. For some people, it's like a really, really kind of, it's a way of tuning into yourself and your environment. Other people just want to get out. The fact, the physical fact of this manifestation of resonance in the space is undeniable. It's like it is happening. Yes. I think the the key thing here is is how do people feel about that? How do people engage with it, and what does it do to them? And that's you know, in this piece, in the context of this piece, playing out of the subjective experience of the player. Yeah, the audience is subjected to whatever the player is doing, uh, and and that's directed by their own experience. Quite, yeah. Yeah, and this con just to really, really clarify in this context, what I mean by tune a frequency to a space is, is play a resonant frequency of a space within it. Yeah, to tune the synthesizer. I'm, I'm weighting the key, and that key is tuned then to the fundamental frequency of a given space. Yeah. Yes. For me, you're tuning out with the space. Do you know what I mean? I understand you're tuning to. What, what kind of, yeah. I'll, 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 it sounds like I'll go being in harmony, in harmony with something. Like if you're in harmony with the environment, then you're being in tune with something. There's lots of, like, you can go off down a real etymological winding path here. You know, wh I, th I think the word resonance is interesting in society more broadly anyway, because it's like, yeah, we resonated with each other, you know, and uh, there are these broader connotations of, I guess, what this work's trying to explore, which is what is it to literally, if, if we resonate with each other in conversation, what is it to literally resonate with it, with a building? What does that do to us? What does that process and, 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 and um, act um, achieve or, or not achieve? It could be repulsive, it could be 
uh, amazing, but uh, I'm interested in exposing people to that in order to kind of open those discussions up. Hey. Hi. Um, I think the young gentleman has um, touched on what I was going to uh, comment on. Um, I was going to say that it's uh, subjective to one's interpretation of what tuning in is. And if you, who are doing the presentation, is giving us your interpretation of what tuning in and tuning out is, mm. I think that would help one to sort of evaluate the work, mm. you know, according to your eyes, as opposed to um, looking at it from what tuning in means in the dictionary or, yeah, right. you know. Yeah. But the word harmony came to mind when I was doing the walk, walk up and down. Then I felt different... Uh, 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 I experienced different um, vibrations in different parts of my body. I mean, I was going to ask that can someone get a heart attack from, you know, being exposed to something like that. At some point, I felt it in my ears, right side, left side, back of my head. I got sensations in my chest, like my heart. So, um, and I didn't think, for me personally, I didn't think of the word harmony or in tune or not in tune. It was just, I felt it was more to do with this space and that if you were to do the same thing in a different space, the result will be different? Mm. That's my... That's is absolutely that a what the work is trying to do. Okay. You just explained the work. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, for the avoidance of doubt here, my definition of tuning in, I mean, it is even probably better just to park that word. There is a completely undeniable acoustic process that takes place in these works where the um, acoustic properties of rooms are exposed in various ways, and then people engage with them. Maybe that's the clearest way of saying it, yeah. And I think as you framed it from the position of acoustics, yeah, there's a certain precision and a certain lack of metaphor involved in that practice. It is quite concrete. Precisely, yeah. Um, and, and the subjectivity and that, that concrete um, starting point then opens itself up to subjectivity. That's the kind of way around that I've been trying to approach things from. Um, you touched on a kind of a lack of sonic vernacular almost, um, which we have at our disposal, or at least like a lack of command, maybe, of a sonic vocabulary. Um, and obviously that's something that Salome's wrote about a lot, um, and it's something that I'm really interested in. Uh, and I guess I'm wondering how does that kind of manifest itself in your practice, um, also in writing? Do you find that a difficult thing to navigate? Is it problematic for you in any way? I think there's a really interest. I think that's really interesting, and it, the thing greatly interests me. I I wonder sometimes if it's a little bit of a pointless task trying to develop endless vocabularies for these things, because what I'm trying to pursue, at least with this spatial listening practice, is a situation in which the vernacular is emergent from someone's process of sounding and listening. So that vernacular is not communicated in terms of ver uh, verbal verbal terms. Rather, it is communicated in someone's process of acting on the space and listening. The process, the practice of listening, is emergent through someone's process of sounding. And for me, that's the thing that I'm trying to latch onto here. I think the recordings of the pieces in motion themselves. You know, for example, I didn't manage to play the video of the dancers, but the dancers' movements are a sonic vernacular. Yeah. Someone's process of singing, you know into a space to uncover its resonances is a vernacular. So I try and create these kind of really generic languages of sounding or, or algorithms mm. where you can kind of judge, yeah, this process against the algorithm and then to sort of try and understand it from that perspective. But yeah, writing about this stuff's really challenging. Um, there's a really excellent book called by a guy called Jean-Francois Agoyard, which is called Sound Effect. And he tries to catalog, you know, a library of perceptible acoustic effects and sort of note their physical, cultural, uh, historical uh, attributes. But yeah, it's, it's very, I found it very, very difficult to write that um, document because you're really dealing with, and, and the way that I wrote it, I think really was from my own exp sonic experience. I tried to lead everything in the project, not by kind of theorizing a piece or, or um, planning a work, but by experiencing this stuff and allowing the works, the writing to emerge out of, exactly as you described that experience of walking through the space, you know, the complexity of that experience, how can you map it and then transfer that to a work and how can you trans then transfer that to a theoretical paradigm? Or so for me, it comes, from, it comes from sensation and the ways in which sen sen sensation can rep be represented by processes of s bodily processes of sounding, of movement, of 
um, speech, but, but I think speech is a very, a very sort of low resolution uh, interpretation of these phenomena. Thank you. Thank you. That was picking on what we were just talking about in the previous question. The second year is we're just working through an article at the moment ca called Sonic Materialism. There's copies of it on the uh, notice board outside the sound office. So if any of you are interested in picking up some of these phenomenal or noumenal experiences of sound, it's a really excellent contemporary text. Quite dense, but um, interesting nonetheless. It's available for you all to kind of um, read at any point. Any other questions? Is that the Christoph Cox one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi there. I was wondering whether I mean, any pr are there any practical ways of mapping out the different nodes of the different resonant frequencies? Because outside of an ideal, uh, let's say, a, a cube-shaped um, space, I think it becomes really complex for a, a human being to actually map out exactly where everything falls out. But today with new, for example, the deep learning and these kind of technologies, is it possible, or has it has it been done so far? I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're aware of it. Yes. If there's there's, there's ways, practical ways of doing it fast. Yes. And, okay. yes. I, I think there's a more important kind of ontological question there about where your work is directed. And this project, I didn't really expand on it much, but it responds or it reacts to this notion of acoustics as, as remedial. Yeah. So the way, the manner in which we commercially tr uh, develop spaces acoustically right now is to do with making them quieter or making them sound um, a specific way in response to a kind of abstract aim, you know, whether that's working or, do or doing this. We don't design from the perspective of creating with sound. And, and often these technologies, it's quite interesting because they're employed to do exactly that. They're employed for sort of remedial means. But the answer is yes. And initially in my work, I pursued that, mu that technical approach much more. But what I fi find is you get into ever finer detail and you sort of never reach a conclusion. Sound constantly escapes you, no matter how much definition you get into. So for me, the um, interesting thing with this project is to embrace that transience and to pin the focus on the listening engagement, on the person's engagement, and to try and get something out of that. But I think, yeah, also I needed to engage a certain level of technical proficiency in order to arrive at that, in order to create these situations of sound. But um, yeah, I think it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous game. One of my um, colleagues at Leeds is doing a PhD in which he's conducting ridiculously fine grain acoustic analyses and making kind of multi-channel loudspeaker works. And they do, I mean, they are phenomenal. They do really kind of play with r real, the space in real detail. Cool, thanks. Hi, Alex. Oh, Hi. it's really weird hearing my own voice. Um, thank you for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, this isn't really a very well-formed question, I don't think, but it's just maybe Brilliant. something that I thought about kind of off the back of, of this because I found all the work regarding resonance and kind of, sorry to say again, but tuning in to a space and just experiencing a space acoustically really fascinating. Um, you mentioned... I don't think I pronounce his name very well, Marc Auger's work, non-places, and you gestured towards a few of those. And some of the place spaces that you mentioned here, I mean, while I wouldn't class them as, as non-spaces exclusively, uh, you know, I guess they were kind of public spaces or maybe, what, I'm, what I think I was trying to, I'm thinking is how, I know your work is, we spoke about whether it's philosophical or scientific or whatever, or that kind of thing, but philosophically speaking, when you go into a space and it's like a, a contested space, or there's like a, I'm wondering if this can be translated into learning about the like philosophy and of a space and how it contests, how it is, is contested sociologically, um, and whether there's anything regarding your work in the spaces that maybe interferes with the space or you know could be considered unwelcome in the space. That's a really lovely question, and it's a part of the practice that I'm absolutely fascinated by and probably want to explore a bit more. Um, I think yes to all of that stuff. Um, there's a really interesting, so Lefebvre in the production space goes on to talk about this notion of a revolt. 
he talks about this idea of abstract space or which kind of interfaces with non-places. So non-places, they lack relationality. You could be in any supermarket, you could be in any airport, you could be in any uh, shopping center. And abstract space, which is, exists purely for the production of capital, so you know, offices and the ways in which we create, like lots of spaces in the city of London, for example, looks similar to spaces in other cities. I, I was interested in thinking about this, and he talks about this revolt. Why don't we revolt in massive numbers against these spaces which destroy our senses, is what he says. And I like this idea of a pra this practice as something which intervenes, which, mm -hmm. which brings uh, elements of the sensory or the auditory to these spaces which are starved of those things. So that's one thing. And it's difficult to do. It's difficult to, like, to intervene. So, you know, it becomes a sort of form of sonic activism, I suppose. And I think I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. Jo Jonathan Bennett did a, 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 a project called Shotgun Architecture where he went and did these massive gunshots in kind of uh, these kinds of spaces. Another thing I would say is that the spaces that this practice naturally ends up in are quite often very interesting in the sense that they're often abandoned or they're industrial or mm. they're in weird parts of a city because that's where the big acoustics are. That's where the spaces which have been acoustically neglected lie and therefore and the spaces that are the most fertile ground for these practices to take place. Mm. So I think that there's some interesting dynamics going on there. But yeah, I'm much more interested to extend this into the social. I think for me, some of the problems with this practice with, is that it's constrained so much to the physical. Sure. Go on, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say, well, in response to, to that, yeah. I mean, I th there's probably some very interesting, um, not so much answers to come across, but just some ideas and results to come across from um, looking at how kind of doing this in different spaces and looking at perhaps the kind of demographics that those spaces are frequented by or contested by or designed for, mm. what the acoustical results of those mm. are and how they compare mm. and, mm. you know, what are, what are the kind of acoustical implications of the spaces designed for different parts of our of, of our world? Mm. I think that, yeah. And I think something that the, my PhD examiner said, which I thought was really interesting, was like, "It's great you've done this stuff in you know art spaces and so on, and that works, and it's it's interesting. But this stuff is magical, and it's like, why can't you use it to bring magic to places that don't have so much? Like he was saying, you know, take it to kind of to council estates and to um, like, you know." Areas that don't would would never have seen like this practice may have never been a practice that this may have never manifested and see and his that was his kind of um, provocation I suppose he's a guy called Paul Whitty who's um, in the Sonic Arts Research Department at Oxford Brooks but I thought that was quite an interesting provocation yeah I agree thank you thanks for your question. If I might ask a question, um, we're all. It's about making work, and there are challenges every step of the way in making creative work, from when we begin to continuing to finishing. And most of the people in the room are at a kind of a beginning of a cycle of kind of making work, beginning a project. Is there any particular challenges that you come across at that phase of making work, or any advice you'd give to us about how you start, continue, and finish any of your projects? Mm. I like to disregard the notion of the work almost entirely, if possible. Uh, that's how I find it most productive to make work. Because it's the same when I was starting to write my PhD. It's just the most insane idea that you would end up with a PhD, or having written a PhD. The only way that you can start is by starting, <laughs> you know? So I think this idea of arriving at a, a kind of preconceived thing uh, from the outset is problematic. So we're talking about this notion of like sonic knowledge as being a process, listening being a process, experiencing work being a process, the works themselves being iterative, being part of a broader process of investigation. The thing that kind of propels me forward most strongly is, is an idea or a hunch or something that feels magical or um, fertile. So whether that's, yeah, like an acoustic phenomena that's really fascinating or something we do with sound that's you know a material or a, or a form of communication or a phenomenon of, of some description that you can frame and then what where does that framing what 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 process does that lead you to the other thing i would say is um i i find it helpful to document every single part of the process because you never know what you might catch that's then useful later and um that will always help you in any re reflective writing you have to do so 
I record, um, a lot of the PhD was me putting a standing wave into a room, walking around and talking to, into my iPhone about what I was experiencing, then later typing that down and then kind of working with that. So how can you, every single thing you do, how can you make that count towards something? You don't need to know what the thing is. You do not need to know what the thing is, but just keep building up stuff and then begin to shape that stuff in relation to what you find most interesting about it. It's quite vague, isn't it? But that, yeah, that's how I do it anyway. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Alex DeLittle, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. I've got nine copies of this. Um, if anyone's interested, come and grab one on the way out. They're £10. If you'd like a copy of that and you don't have any cash with you, come and talk to me. <laughs> I'm on a commission of uh, 10%, isn't it? <laughs>